الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعينه ونعوذ به من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله خلق فسوى خلقكم من نفس واحدة خلق الأزواج كلها الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى وأشهد أن سيدنا وأولنا والشهيد علينا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبده ورسوله وما كان لمؤمن ولا مؤمنة إذا قضى الله ورسوله أمرا أن يكون لهم الخيرة من أمرهم من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا مضل له ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا هادي له ومن يتوكل على الله فإن الله على كل شيء قدير أما بعد أيها المؤمنون One of the issues that has not been given sufficient and proper attention and discussion in a public forum is the issue of women in Islam. Many Muslims have inherited a cultural treatment of Muslims, of Muslim women, that is veneered with Islam. If we take the time and make the effort to refer to Allah and His Prophet, we wouldn't have this inferiority position of women in our communities and in our countries. So whenever the issue of male and female or men and women or equal rights or equality among the gen- uh, between the genders, whenever these types of issues come up, feel comfortable to go to Allah Azza wa Jal and listen to his words on this matter. This is a subject that can flow for many khutbas. So let us try in this khutbah to zero in on the fact that Muslims have no discrimination issue between man and woman, or between husband and wife, or between male and female. Let's try to learn from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One ayah in the Quran says, وَقُلْنَا يَا آدَمْ 
اسكن انت وزوجك الجنه and we meaning Allah jalla wa ala said O Adam dwell reside in al jannah you and your wife the word in the Quran is zawjuk and that word means it, it, it doesn't technically mean wife but in the context here it means wife don't think it means wife everywhere else you see it in the Quran so what does zawj mean zawj means your couple what makes you a couple what makes you a pair that's a zawj you and your double reside and dwell in al jannah some of us read this and keep on going let's take a mental stop here and think about al jannah before the disobedience of Allah occurred there. Al-Jannah is a place of equality, of the absence of prejudice or discrimination. So here we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying to us that He told Adam and Hawa to dwell in Al-Jannah. So there was equality here. There was no one saying a man is better than a, a, a woman or a woman is inferior to a man. They were on par with each other. That's important to, to realize. Another ayah says, Udkhulu antum wa azwajukum al jannah. After our judgment on the final day, those who earned Al Jannah are told, Enter you and your doubles, Azwajukum Al Jannah. So when this is when this is mentioned in the Quran, it could be Allah speaking to the to the women and telling them enter al jannah with your double meaning the husbands and equally so it could mean the husbands and allah saying them to them enter with your wives into al jannah so there's no gender discrimination when allah uses the word azwaj if if men were meant in this ayah, like many of us understand, if men was meant by azwaj, he would have said, Udkhulu antum wa al jannah. Then that would have meant wives particularly. But the word azwaj goes, goes both ways. So even in the wording of the ayat in the Qur'an, there is an inclusive equality between a husband and a wife or a man and a woman. We run into a hadith, and you know we've been Qur'anically critical of some wayward hadiths. There's a hadith related to Allah's Prophet. It's called a hadith, but it doesn't fit into the climate of the Quran. It says that women are naqisatu aqlin wa deen. Which means which means women are deficient in their minds and in their deen. They have deficient minds and they have deficient deen. 
How does that square with an ayah in the Quran in which Allah says, وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ The pronoun used, the feminine pronoun in this ayah, لَهُنَّ عَلَيْهِنَّ This feminine pronoun says to us, that women, as much as they are to give, it is expected that we give to them. You see the equality? You can't, you know, sort of, let me put it in pedestrian language, you can't milk a wife or a daughter or a sister, you can't milk her. Taking all of the advantages out of her, without her being given in proportion to what she gave. And this applies across the board. وَلَهُنَّ The ayah, we refer to Allah, there's no philosopher speaking here, there's no commentator, there's no analyst, it's the pure ayah. وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Now we, we take a broader look at some of these ayat without going into the nitty-gritty of each ayah or each context. When, when we take a look at some of the uli al-azm min al-rusul, the most motivated, let's say, of Allah's messengers. Musa alayhi salam. Begin with Musa. Musa, in the ayat in the Quran, there's plenty of them that speak about Musa. There's no mention of any father. Have you ever realized this? You read the Quran. Musa is a prophet that had him and Bani Israel around one third of the ayat of the Quran about them. And we haven't heard of Musa's father. Has anyone heard of Musa's father? Of course, if people begin to go to the Israeliyat, the information that comes from Israeli sources, and they made their way into our tafsirs, into our Islamic books of history and hadith and literature, etc. You'll find some, something or the other. But as far as Allah's Prophet and the Qur'an are concerned, there's no mention of uh, Musa's father. So what are we left with? Musa's mother. وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ We have, depending on your preference of words, we have inspired the mother of Musa. The other one is inspired her with revelation. Instead of saying the word revealed, and some people getting the impression we're elevating her to the status of some prophet, forget about that. We're not doing that. So here is the mention of Ummi Musa. She is the one who was responsible for the upbringing of Musa. وَرَدَدْنَاكَ إِلَىٰ أُمِّكَ We had you, Musa, revert to your mother. You know, after she had placed him on floating waters and the details therein, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had him return to be breastfed by his biological mother. Who cared for him? The wife of the Pharaoh, another woman. And we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises her for being contrary to her husband, the Pharaoh, a person who belongs with the people of Allah and in al-Jannah that is to come. That's how he was brought up. His biological mother and his, let's use the word so that we can go on, adopted mother. When we come to Isa ibn Maryam, 
another prophet from Uli Azim Min al Rusul. Does anyone? He doesn't have a father. Period. So the influence on him as he was growing up was his mother, Maryam alayhima as salatu was salam. So here we have once again. And please, sisters, I know this khutbah goes out to uh, different parts of the world. This khutbah is trying to encourage you to have contact with Allah in His book and to read about the life of Allah's Prophet in His struggle so that you can understand you are not inferior you're not meant to be excluded in the masajid. You are not meant to be banned from the masajid. You are not to be discouraged to express your Islamic mind on the issues. As you understand Allah, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, and His Prophet. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon Him and His. So here we have Musa, his mother, his adopted mother, no man. Here we have Isa, no man as father, no no father. We don't have any information about Musa having, of course Musa had a father, but we don't have any information pertaining to the influence of a father on his son, Musa. Isa, everyone knows, he doesn't have a father. So obviously there was no influence in his growing up and maturity from a father. Then we come to the last Prophet of Allah. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon them and theirs. He, he, was, he was born without a father. He was an orphan. And then when he grew up, we only know two persons in his First years in life, his mother Amina and his breastfeeding mother Halima as Saadiya. We don't know any other individuals who impacted his early life except women. No man formulating his formative years in life. And then if we want to take a look at some other ayat in the Qur'an that speak about or somehow relate to this issue, there's an ayah that says, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا طَائِرٍ يَطِيرُ بِجَنَاحَيْهِ إِلَّا أُمَمٌ أَمْثَالُكُمْ There is not a beast that walks the earth and no airborne creature except that they are umam they are organized collectivities the same way you are meaning men reference umamun amthalukum just like you our lives are organized we are organized beings that's an ummah an organized collectivity. Okay. So we take a look at one of these flying collective forms of life. And it's it's a surah in the Quran, Surah Al Nahal. You take a look at the Nahal. Bees. What happens in the organization of their life? They have hives, beehives. Those beehives are centered around the female bee, not the male. The only thing the male does, he impregnates the female and then he's gone. He's dead. He's either killed or he dies. And what do we have as a result of a female bee kingdom, so to speak? What do we have? We have all the females doing all the work, going out into the fields, 
bringing back. And all of this, of course, is by Allah's inspiration and by Allah's control. And what do they give us? Something that the Qur'an, Allah's words describe as fihi shifa'un linnas. They give us a product, they are productive. Not lazy, not sitting back, inferior, this other stuff that when you look at human beings, we treat ourselves sometimes worse than the bees or other animal kingdoms treat them their own females. They're productive and they give us something that is that has remedy and therapy for people. And that's the honey that we consume. And then we go to Surah Yusuf. There are many lessons to be extracted from Surah Yusuf. One one way of thinking through some of the ayat in Surah Yusuf is that it was when when you read these uh, ayat at the beginning of the surah, you realize that the children of Prophet Yaqub, males, no no mention of a female regarding his children. That's the first generation of Bani Israel. They were all males, no female within that family. When we read the Quran, if you go to other books, you might find some other uh, Israeliyat in it. So what are these males, what were they doing? They were creating problems within a family. These brothers, ten brothers of Yusuf, were crea- the one brother who's uh, uh, said to be Yusuf's full brother, and this area here also remains an area of back and forth among, let's say, Islamic scholars. And, and without us taking sides and avoiding this issue, the final line when we read these ayat, we find that we are in encountering individuals, males, men, who are causing problems and trouble. And we find that the father himself could not control the psychology of his own children. The father comes in Ashku Bethi wa Husni ilallah. Because of these male children, he said, I express, I complain my internal hurt and my sadness to Allah because of what they did to their own brother. So, what does this tell you? When the mother, the wife is absent, this is what this is what begins to happen. Even a prophet cannot influence his own children. And they create these types of issues that snowballed later on in the surah and we saw we understand what happened to Yusuf. Weren't these the brothers of Yusuf, the males, the men who said with a criminal undercurrent اقتلوا يوسف او اطرحوه ارضا يخل لكم وجه ابيكم وتكون من بعده قوما صالحين kill yusuf it wasn't a lady who said that and i'm not here trying to score men versus women or women versus men i should have said that at the beginning of the khutbah I have to emphasize that men and women are co-equals of each other. No one is superior, no one is inferior when we come to husbands and wives or sisters and brothers, etc. There is no one above the, the, the other. The woman is not above the man and the man is not above the woman. Get that straight. (laughs) 
Wasn't it Yaqub the father because of what his sons did? Sons, not daughters. I have to repeat this because when we read the Quran, we don't read it with relativity to our what's what's being done to the genders today. He said it was he was described what min al Yaqub's eyes had a veneer of white over them because of the sadness in him of what his own sons did. And then uh, these men, the first generation of Bani Israel, وَجَاءُوا أَبَاهُمْ عِشَاءً يَبْكُونَ They came to their father in the evening crying, crocodile tears, men. And they, they lie. They said to their father, إِنَّا ذَهَبْنَا نَسْتَبِقُ وَتَرَكْنَا يُوسُفَ عِنْدَ مَتَاعِنَا فَأَكَلَهُ الذِّئِبُ We went racing. And we left Yusuf with our stuff, maybe their gear. What you would have in agricultural societies, maybe a stick, maybe a certain type of shoe or whatever. And the wolf ate, devoured Yusuf. Who's saying this? Is it a lady? Are these women? Are these females? Read through the Qur'an and try to pinpoint problems that come from, let's call them the gentle gender. You won't come across that as frequently as you'll come across these problems emanating from men. And Yusuf said, مِنْ بَعْدِ أَنْ نَزَغَ الشَّيْطَانُ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ إِخْوَتِي Yusuf السلام, acknowledges that the shaytan had a bad or divisive influence between him and his own brothers. And then at the end of Surah Yusuf, Towards the end, there's a, a subtle type of exposition of how Yusuf felt towards his brothers and how Yaqub felt towards his sons. The same Bani Israel, there's the father, Yaqub, and there's the brother, Yusuf. Yusuf said to them when they finally met all together in Egypt, الْيَوْمَ يَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ Today, Allah will forgive you as He is the most merciful of the most mercifuls. When it came to the father, Well, before, let me also say something that has to be said. Usually, the father has more care, more love for his sons than a brother has for his siblings. The father expresses more passion towards his son, sons in this case, then a brother would express passion towards his brothers. That's the normal way families are. In this case, Yusuf, the brother, expressed 
more affection for his brothers than the father expressed for his sons. The opposite of what we observe in families. So Yusuf, when, when everything settled, everyone knew what was going on, all of this story in the past decades, that the narrative that developed, which is all of Surah Yusuf, he says, يَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Allah will, اليوم, today, Allah will forgive you for what you have done. So what did the father say? The father said, they said, Ya Abana istaghfir lana dhunubana. Kala sawfa astaghfiru lakum rabbi. The word sawfa means I will in the future. There's two letters in Arabic. One of them is seen, sa, and the other one is sawfa. When you put the scene before a verb, a present tense verb, it means I will do it in the, I will either do it now or in the coming near future, tomorrow, next week. But when you use the word sofa before a present tense verb, it means I will do it in the distant future, meaning next month or next year, which means what here? What does this tell us? The father was hurt so much because of what his children did towards their own brother that he didn't have it within, within him in that moment to say, Oh Allah, forgive my sons. And sofa sometimes could even go to al akhira not, not a distant future in this world. Wala sawfa yu'at. In another ayah in the Quran, in Surah Al-Duha, Wala sawfa yu'atika rabbuka fatarda. After many years in which the Prophet didn't receive revelation from Allah, this surah, Surah Al-Duha, wal layli idha saja was revealed, and Allah says to him, to his prophet, don't feel left out, don't feel isolated, don't feel discommunicated just because Wahi hasn't come to you for some time. He says to him, Wala sawfa yu'tika rabbuka fatarda. Your sustainer is going to give you in the long run sawfa until you are satisfied. And then we also find one of these areas in the Qur'an, peculiar to men. I don't think this would have happened if it was a woman in, in Yusuf's position. But finally, when he realized who his brothers were, the first time they came, his brothers came from, let's say, Palestine. They went to Egypt. They were transacting. They wanted food. He realized these were his brothers. He didn't say, come, I'm your brother. It's finally solved. We'll send to my, for our father, he will come and all is well. No. There were some details that had to be done. Go back to your father. He didn't say, my, our father. He says, Tell your father that your son stole something. Another ayah in the Qur'an, I think which, or two other narratives in the Qur'an that gives you something to think about whenever people bring this issue of women being naqisati aqlin wa deen. They repeat this, some of these machismo characters, they repeat this type of thing. We have in the Qur'an the Pharaoh, Pharaoh. And we have in the Quran, the Pharaoh was the dictator in Egypt. And we have in the Quran, Malika to Saba, the Queen of Sheba. These were two 
let's say, un-Islamic rulers. What happened to the Pharaoh, the man who was ruling? He, he pursued Musa to death until Allah finished him off and he drowned in the Red Sea. That was the man who was ruling. Malika to Saba. She behaved like the, the Pharaoh of Egypt. She came to Sulaiman, Inni aslam tu ma'a Sulaiman li rabbil alameen. I confess or I affirm my Islam with Prophet Sulaiman to the sustainer of the worlds. Now, how, how do you tell me what argument these types of people have? who exclude women. What type of argument do they have if they are reading the Qur'an and then comparing man with woman? The Pharaoh said, مَا أُرِيكُمْ إِلَّا مَا أَرَى He's telling his citizens, I present to you whatever I view. I show you whatever I see. And what did Malikat Saba say? A statement that is applicable until the end of time. A rule that describes those who are autocrats and dictators. إِنَّ الْمُلُوكَ إِذَا دَخَلُوا قَرْيَةً أَفْسَدُوهَا وَجَعَلُوا أَهْلَهَا أَذِلَّةً وَكَذَلِكَ يَفْعَلُوا Compare what the Pharaoh says, Ana Rabbukumul A'la. Another statement of the Pharaoh, Ana Rabbukumul A'la. Compare what the Pharaoh says with what Balqis, the Queen of Sheba, said. We take our own Prophet in his history, and alhamdulillah, many of us are versed on the Prophet's history. When he received the first word from Allah, and angel Jibreel appeared to him and he was in this state of almost controlled shock who did he go to? you'd expect a man seeing an angel hearing words of revelation he'd go to his peers he'd go to his friends he'd go to his men acquaintances, what did he do? He immediately went to his wife, Khadija. What does that tell you and me? What, is, what, what should this mean to you and me? Especially those out there who have the Islamic minbar, who discriminate against women. What does that tell them? How do they explain this? When the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, when he passed away, he passed away in the presence of his female family members, wife and daughter. Now here's where we get into, you know, the different hadiths that have different channels in Muslim history. I don't care. If you're a Sunni, and you consider the hadith, خُذُوا نُصْفَ دِينِكُمْ عَنْ هَذِهِ الْحُمَيْرَى this, this is in reference to Aisha. Or whether it's a Shia hadith about the attributes and the high status of Lady Fatima as Zahra alayha salam. Doesn't matter. In both cases, in both cases, there is a reference to the women in the Prophet's household. You, you realize in the Qur'an, when Allah mentions men, يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَيَقْتُلُونَ وَيُقْتَلُونَ Men undergo combat duty and in the process they are, they kill or are killed. That's warfare. Men, okay, يَقْتُلُونَ وَيُقْتَلُونَ 
When it comes to women, the ayah in the Quran, after speaking about the natural cataclysmic eruptions, إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَتْ وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ سُجِّرَتْ then, وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ The mistreatment of men towards women, whether it's burying them alive when they are infants, whether it is aborting fetuses during pregnancy, or whether it is killing them in acts like honor killings or some other slow death in society. It's about time, I think, that we listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not have the type of gender, sex arguments that go back and forth. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ ادعوه سبحانه وأنتم على يقين بالإجابة وتوبوا إلى الله غافر الذنب وقابل التوب شديد العقاب وإليه المصير الحمد لله الذي هدى وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا المصطفى وعلى آله وصحبه أولي النهى وأولي التقى Dear brothers, dear sisters, dear committed Muslims We try in this second khutbah to shed light It's about time Muslims wake up and begin to put the meanings of the Qur'an in the developments of the day. We have now, according to some sor- news sources, documents by a third party, probably European or American, trying to cover up weapons transactions between the rulers in Arabia, the Saudi ruling family, and the Zionist Israelis in colonized Palestine. It's one issue. Where does that fit into? You see, they, 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 they people try, I mean, uh, influential mouthpieces, they try to say, why, why are you, as a Muslim, why are you bringing up these types of issue in a Jumu'ah prayer? Because in their minds, they split affairs of state from affairs of scripture. Each goes its own way. We don't have that. If people who are in state making decisions that are killing us, it's our moral duty to say, you are a criminal for what you are doing. And we say this to these rulers in the Arabian Peninsula. The son-in-law of the occupant of the White House, whose residence is just around the corner, by the way. It is reported in some of these news sources that he's going to attend that yearly, it's called Davis in the Desert, in which financiers and CEOs, entrepreneurs, tycoons, capitalists, all of them go and meet to discuss how are they going to spend the resources of you and me, the average person. Squander those resources. We're told that Twitter suspended the account of Saud al-Qahtani, the person who was responsible for the butchering of one of his colleagues, a Saudi journalist in the consulate of Saudi Arabia in Istanbul. It took all that time to suspend him from Twitter. It's because of our indifference, inaction, passivity, isolation. What do we have to do with these types of things? If all of the masajid in the world were buzzing with these facts, these types of steps would have been taken a long time ago. And then there's a Saudi, 
Uh, he's a secular Saudi. Nevertheless, he's opposed to the Saudi regime, who has been behind bars for many years. His family is living as a refugee family, immigrant family in Canada. Well, they, he's gone on hung, hunger strike now. We don't know about the other Islamic type of prisoners and what their condition is. The administration here in Washington, D.C., the Pentagon, they're sent, sending 200 troops to Saudi Arabia with the Patriot missile system and some other military gadgets. And this also speaks to the quietism of the American public when the this type of administration or any other type of administration is in support of criminals and crooks and cabals in the Arabian Peninsula. Then we have human rights, the Human Rights Committee in the United Nations. They expressed this week their concern with the political prisoners and with the killing of Khashoggi a year ago this coming week. Yeah, words are cheap. They can express as much as they want. It's ink on paper or it's words in the wind. Saudi Arabia now is issuing e-visas for tourists from 49 countries. And you can surmise what, who, what countries they are. European countries, the United States, Japan, China. They want them to go and spend their money there. They've also said women now, foreign women, meaning non-Saudi women, in, in some conservative mind, it may mean non-Muslim women, now they can walk in the streets of the cities of Saudi Arabia without the abaa, without that long dress that they were forced to wear in previous years and previous times. In the year 2017, billions of dollars were invested by the Saudi regime to build resorts, luxurious resorts on the Red Sea. And now, with these types of policies, after they go into effect, which is this year and the coming year, etc., they're looking at the year 2030, to be the cumulative year when all of these policies will pay off because they say about 10% of their national income is going to come from tourism. They don't want to rely on oil as their sole money-making export. So here we have it, brothers and sisters. If these p cities, if these policies continue, Mecca and the Medina are going to become twin sin cities. Keep, keep on being indifferent. Keep on being silent. And this is what is rapidly approaching because of the complicity of the silence that we are exhibiting. On an, in another part of the uh, Muslim realm, all of a sudden, Moroccan intelligence, the intelligence services in Morocco came out and said they did not put out any news item, any information pertaining to the mother of Assisi in Egypt. Because there are news reports that indicate that his mother came from Morocco from a Yehudi family in Morocco. There's nothing wrong with being a Yehudi Moroccan. But there's everything wrong with being a Zionist Moroccan or a Zionist Arab. 
And so when people are beginning to open their eyes, I mean, who is this person ruling in Egypt? And the news, I, the news that was that circulated years ago was that she had to become an Egyptian citizen so that her son, the current ruler in Egypt, could be admitted into the military academy. The rules there don't permit admission into the academy unless both father and mother are Egyptian citizens. So now, because of what's happening inside of Egypt and inter-Arab politics, the Moroccan intelligence came out and said, don't get us involved in this issue. We had nothing to say about it. The United Arab Emirates, in the year 2022, that's only three years away, they're going to inaugurate Officially, the first synagogue in that country. Yeah, okay, fine. Alhamdulillah, we are we encourage Jews and Christians to follow their scriptures. That's part of our belief. But we don't encourage Jews and Christians to be Zionists and imperialists. What the average Muslim should be asking himself is what type of synagogue, what type of rabbis, are they going to be Zionists who are going to be performing religious services in this public, official synagogue? We dare them say to rabbis from Naturi Karta, those are Jews opposed to Zionism, this kines, this synagogue, this temple is yours. Come and officiate the religious Jewish rites in this synagogue. It's probably going to be given to Zionist rabbis. We hope not, but if their policies are any indication, that's the way it's going to go. This past week at the United Nations, the General Assembly, when heads of state from all around the world come to meet and speak, the Israeli foreign minister said that he has met with an influential foreign minister from an Arab country. He didn't say who that was. What is he trying to do? Protect him? And that foreign minister from whichever Arab, he said important Arab country, from whichever important Arab country that was, are you sneakingly meeting with a war criminal? There have been press reports that tell us 80,000 Israelis in the past year visited Morocco. You see what our... Uh, I'm not going to be bothered with, with political issues, with day-to-day -day developments, with ideological arguments and these things. Don't get me involved in all... Okay, You're not involved in all of this. The masjid has become a place to nap. If you want the masjid to become a place to go to sleep, this is what's going to begin to happen and multiply. Today's Jumu'ah in Egypt, the khutbah, the sermon of the Jumu'ah, was written by the government. Uyghur students, Muslim Chinese students who are studying in Egypt, obviously most of them are at Al-Azhar University, now they are afraid of being arrested and deported to China. And that's not to speak about another news item concerning the Rohingya Muslims who have been stateless and homeless for the past several years and there's new policies against them in certain countries that they move to and are living at a subsistence level. We condemn those speakers on Friday who are silent about these affairs because their silence is contributing to the misery 
and the death of Muslims. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan warzuqna tiba'ah. وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ولا تجعله ملتبسا علينا واجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ربنا أفرغ علينا صبرا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ربنا أفرغ علينا صبرا وتوفنا مسلمين ربنا افتح بيننا وبين قومنا بالحق وأنت خير الفاتحين ربنا صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وآل محمد وصل وسلم وبارك على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي للصلاة حي للفلاة قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا 